Well, thank you very much. Um, uh, so, okay. Uh, first of all, like, hello and uh, welcome everybody from different parts of the world who are joining us today for this week's uh, Inverses Chandrasekhar and Random Geometry Colloquium. And today we're extremely glad to have Professor Hugo Dumiril Kopa with us, who will be uh, giving us two talks in two successive weeks. So today's talk, which is a colloquium talk, is on emergent symmetries in two-dimensional statistical physics. And this will be followed by a length, longer, more detailed talk in the next week, starting from the same time, where we'll um, touch upon a recent breakthrough that uh, he and his co-authors have made on the subject. I hope I'll see all of you there as well. Uh, so before I pass it on to Hugo, I'll just request everybody to please remember to mute yourself unless you have some question to ask. Um, so, okay, without uh, further delay, to Hugo. Well, thank you uh, very much. Uh, do you hear me well? Yes, Hugo, perfect. Okay, perfect. Um, so today's talk is really uh, a general talk somehow. It's, it's uh, actually, I even got confused. I, I did prepared it as a colloquium talk. So probably it's going to be understandable for probabilists, which is a good thing. Next week, so it, this week is basically going to give you the context of uh, the result. And at the very end of the talk, I will state our results. And uh, next week, I will uh, give you details, I mean, more details on the result itself mm -hmm. and on its proof. So uh, we are gonna, um, maybe, um, Subhajit, maybe you can, as an organizer, uh, mute people because uh, there are still people that are unmute. Okay, uh, so today, maybe no proofs, but just kind of uh, an idea of the context of the result. So. Let me start with the simplest, uh, I mean, a subset of the context in some sense. And let me tell you a little bit about Bernoulli percolation, which many people already know, but maybe not everybody. So Bernoulli percolation is a model of a random subgraph of a given graph, a given lattice. And in this talk and in next talk, I will always work on Z2. So I will, the underlying lattice, if you want, is a square lattice. Okay, and on this lattice, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna define the random subgraph of it, which I'm gonna denote omega p. So it's gonna be a subgraph of Z2, where the vertices of omega p are just the vertices of Z2, and the edges of omega p are gonna be the edges of Z2. Please mute if you, yeah, thank you. Uh, so that omega p of e is equal to one, where the omega p of e is a family, which is of, of random variable indexed by the edges, which are, it's an IID family of Bernoulli random variable of parameter p. So what does it mean? It means that every edge has omega p, sorry, omega, what is happening? Omega p equal one with probability p independently of the other edges. So every edge has omega p equal one independently with probability p. Um, we say, and I will probably use it a lot, we say that an edge with omega p equal one is an open edge. So this, we, we usually call it an open edge. So every edge is open with probability p independently of the other edges. And the question that we ask, I mean, there are many, many questions that, that, uh, that we can ask on this model, but typically we want to understand the large scale connectivity properties of this graph omega p. So large scale connectivity properties of omega p. 
And the whole talk is going to be going around, I mean, trying to treat this question. OK. So the first thing, which for probabilists is a triviality, but again, I'm not entirely sure of the crowd I'm facing. So let me remind it. The first interesting thing is that obviously when P increases, omega P gets bigger and bigger because the probability of every edge, I mean, of each edge of being open is increasing. And what happens is that there is a critical point, which we call PC, and which is in fact equal to one half. It's a result, a very famous result of Kesten from uh, 1980, which separates two phases. One phase, so for P smaller than PC of Z2, one phase in which all the connected components of omega P are small. What do I mean by that? For instance, I mean that if I take a box of size n by n, then inside the biggest, so here you see the, the picture is such that every connected component is colored in a different color. It's just for aesthetic reasons to be able to see. So here the biggest connective components are logarithmically big. Typically the largest one will be log n. So this is in the phase p smaller than one half. In some sense, P is not big enough to create many connections in omega P and create big, uh, big uh, connected components. On the other hand, when P is larger, so here all connected components are small. And uh, in particular, they are finite. On the other hand, when P is larger than PC, here you can see that you have a huge connected component, the blue one. In fact, it's even an infinite connected component. So when P is larger than PC, there exists a unique infinite connected component. And let me say that there is so this kind of ambient C, this huge, 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 huge uh, connected component. And then the other ones, the smaller ones, the finite ones, because there is a unique infinite, the finite ones are again tiny. So finite connected components are logarithmically big again. So in the box of size n, the largest one will be log n. So a huge one and small ones. Like that. And at p equal pc, there is something much more interesting happening where you start to see several huge, you see, for instance, here, if I draw the boundary of one, I see the boundary of a huge one here. I see the boundary of another one here. By the way, I am not the person who made this simulation. It's Raphael Cerf who made these beautiful simulations. So you have several kind of macroscopically big connected components, meaning if I take a box of size n, I have several connected components of roughly size n. But what is interesting is that none of them are infinite. If I look again at the infinite space, none of these connected components will be infinite. So here, no infinite connected component. But in lambda n, connected components of size n, I mean, roughly n. Maybe it's not n, maybe it's n over two, it's n over 10, but they are big connected components. This is exactly the phase we are interested in. That's the most interesting phase. It's a phase where the phase transition occurs. So the whole talk is gonna be focusing on PC equal one half, uh, on P equal PC, okay? Sorry. There is a question. So no, in radius, it will be log n. In volume, it will be log n squared. You are entirely right. Uh, I was talking vo uh, radius, but you are entirely right that in volume, you get log n squared, yes. Uh, okay, uh, so. Just to understand clearly, even in yes. infinite volume, at PC, there'll be no infinite uh, connected component, but the size of connected components is unbounded above. Is that? Uh... No, so, so you see, I mean, in finite volume, you cannot have an infinite connected component because we are on Z2. 
So the biggest connected component you could have will have radius n, right? What I'm saying is that indeed there are connected components of this size in a box of size n. But if you look at these connected components in infinite volume, if you look at all the points that are connected to this connected component, it's still a finite connected component, right? Let me make a drawing. So you have a box of size n. Let's say I look at the connected components in the box. Let me draw two, uh, two, two examples. There will be big connected components. Now, if I look at, so these connected components, uh, so sorry, I will answer then. Uh, if I look at these connected components in, uh, in, uh, in the whole uh, plane, there may be, you know, I mean, at the end, I was only looking at the restriction of a connected component to the box. So if I, if, uh, if I widen my horizon, I have, I mean, these connected components, maybe they didn't end in the box of size n, maybe they went a little bit further. When you look at them, even when they go a little bit further, they are finite. They are not a finite, it's not just a restriction to a box of an infinite connected component. Okay. Uh, Franco? No, so you see, I mean, in terms of volume, you can create a path like that, which has length n, and then inside the volume is going to be log n squared. It's log n in subcritical and log n squared in supercritical. Yes. Ah, it was for p smaller than pc. Oh, sorry. I, I I thought it was the second. It was a question about p larger than pc because usually that's the place where people make mistakes. Sorry. So Franco, uh, send me a, ah. It was a private message. Franco sent me a private message saying, in subcritical it's log n. Yes, indeed. In subcritical it's log n, and supercritical it's log n in radius, and log n squared in volume. Sorry, I thought that was the question. I I misread the question. Okay, let me go back. To, uh, to the thing. So we are going to focus on this phase. So from now, really think PC equal one, I mean, P equal PC. Let, this is another drawing, still not by me, it's by Vincent Befara, of one large cluster in, uh, in a box. So you see, I mean, here is typically the place where uh, I mean, if this is a boundary of the box, this is typically where it could go further and you could imagine a priori it goes to infinity, but it's not the case. So here is a drawing. And one interesting aspect of this drawing, which I wanted to highlight to you guys, is that if you think about it, the boundary of the cluster is very rough. In fact, it's kind of easy to imagine that this is a fractal. Of course, here I kind of still see if I, I mean, I can still see that I am on a lattice, but there is a very fractal behavior. Okay. And fractal behavior is suggesting scale invariance, right? The fractal is something that is scale invariant. So this fractal picture is kind of suggesting that at criticality, ah, okay. So <laughs> then I answered the right question. Okay. So, it, this thing is suggesting that at PC, there is some kind of additional hidden symmetries in my model. And that's what I want to be discussing during this talk. I want to be highlighting the existence of what we call emerging symmetries in critical Bernoulli percolation. Okay, so let me start with maybe the simplest symmetry to believe. Okay, so I mean two symmetries. So two, uh, I mean emerging symmetries at criticality. So every almost everything I'm going to do today is give you heuristics, and actually very few of the things I'm going to discuss are proved. But at least I think I will, uh, I'm hoping to be able to convince you of certain things. So first thing, as I said, fractal objects 
are by, defini by definition scale invariant. So, so here, what I'm going to do, I'm, I'm going to try to show to you that there is a symmetry, uh, a scale invariant symmetry, uh, a scale invariance in critical percolation. And in order to do that, I'm going to do what we call taking the scaling limit. So I'm going to define omega delta, or maybe omega p delta. So because I'm always working at pc, remember, I'm going to simply drop this parameter just to simplify my life. Maybe it will complicate yours, but I'm not going to refer to p anymore because p is always equal to pc. Okay. But I'm introducing another parameter delta because what I'm going to do is I'm not going to work on Z2. I'm going to work on delta Z2. So now the edges of my lattice have length delta. Okay. So omega delta is exactly a realization of Bernoulli percolation. Remember, it's critical one on delta z2 okay by the way if you are wondering how you want to be thinking of this graph so omega p delta i mean omega delta is a is a random graph you can see it in many ways pick your favorite one it's going to work basically so i don't know maybe you want to be thinking of omega p as a collection of connected components Maybe you want to be thinking of omega p as just a function that is saying which part of the space is connected to which part of the space by a path of open edges. Maybe, and maybe that's the simplest one to draw, so that's the one I'm going to think of. Maybe you want to be thinking of omega p as a collection of loops that are the boundaries of your connected components. Okay, so maybe this is the best thing. So think of omega delta as a collection of loops, which are the boundary that that uh, uh, that follow the boundaries of clusters uh, of connected components. So typically what I started drawing here in red, you just draw in red, you follow in red the whole thing. Because clusters are finite, it's necessarily gonna close and it gives, him, gives me one loop. And you do that for every connected component, okay? Can you say what you mean by realization? Uh, just, uh, I mean, just think uh, a random variable. It's a random okay. variable okay. that uh, corresponds okay. to this. It's a random variable with low Bernoulli percolation on delta z. Okay. okay. That was just a poor, poor way of, uh, of uh, defining this. Okay, so first conjecture. is gonna be the existence of a scaling limit. So you see the operation that I did is kind of just rescaling the lattice. So imagine you do that up to delta equals zero. So you take omega delta and you let delta tend to zero. Well, the conjecture is that omega delta converges. So as a random object, so in low, converges as delta tends to zero to a random variable which I'm going to define, I mean, call omega continuous, okay, o omega count. It's absolutely unclear that omega delta as a sequence of random variables converges. By the way, it's not entirely clear even what is the topology in which you are uh, taking weak convergence, but let me ignore that. Let me just say if you are happy with thinking of omega delta as a collection of loops, just think large loops converge to large loops. So 
omega continuous is going to be basically a random variable taking values in collection of loops, which are basically giving the boundaries of the large clusters. Okay. Okay, so this is the first conjecture and it's a very difficult one. It doesn't seem, I mean, usually uh, in math, we are happy when things converge, but proving that they converge is not that obvious. And in this case, for instance, it's a really uh, a big challenge to prove that omega delta indeed converges as delta tends to zero. But the thing is that once you have convergence, you get two properties of convergence almost for free, of the continuum limit almost for free. So the nice corollary almost of this conjecture is that omega continuous must satisfy two things. The first one is that it must be translation invariant. Uh, let's say may even the, the simplest one is scale invariant. So it's scale invariant, meaning that omega continuous has the same low as lambda times omega continuous for every lambda positive. So it's a random family of loops that is scale invariant. If you zoom out or zoom in by a finite uh, quantity, the law of what you see is the same, which is perfectly in accordance with the fact that you are respecting fractals. So in particular, the loops themselves are typically going to be really true fractals. I mean, random ones, but fractals. Are um, non-intersecting non loops? Yes, they are non-intersecting. Uh, I mean, they are non-crossing loops. Okay, non They may touch each other, but they are not crossing. That's a very good point. Thank you for... Uh, okay. uh, Catching me on that. Are they parameterized or non parameterized? You can parameterize them. Yes, I mean, it's possible to parameterize them. So you need some regularity to be able to prove you can do it nicely, but uh, actually, you can prove indeed that they are parameterizable. Yes. And that is it. Uh, they're, they are, I suppose, uncountable. I mean, I guess, yeah. Um, well, there are limits. Uh, I mean, anyway, no, no, they, they have an interior. I mean, the points themselves. Uh, you could imagine that you have points everywhere, but this is not very interesting. So let's really no, think of uh, the locally finite even uh, family of, uh, ah, of okay. loops. Oh, okay. 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 Locally finite? Okay. I mean, meaning if you take epsilon positive, then the number of loops of size larger than epsilon intersecting, say, the box of size one over epsilon is finite. Okay. 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 But of course, when epsilon tends to zero, you have more and more loops. I mean, not of course, but it is, it is uh, the case. Okay, so this family is scale invariant. And this is easy to see for the simplest reason that omega lambda delta, I mean, sorry, omega, I should not have done that because I'm gonna make the mistake several times. So omega lambda delta with a superscript is also converging to omega continuous. But omega lambda delta, if you think about it, is just, the image by lambda of omega delta. So this is converges to omega lambda omega continuous. So you need necessarily to have equality in law. Okay, so just the property of convergence is already giving you scale invariance. There is a second property, which is translation invariance. Meaning that Omega continuous has the same law as tau x of omega continuous, where tau x is a translation by a vector x for every x in R2. So this is kind of also not very difficult. At least it's easy to see it if you take x in delta z2 for delta fix, then by looking at omega of uh, uh, delta over two to the n, this thing is converging to omega continuous and omega delta over two to the n has exactly uh, x as a just at the lattice level as a symmetry. So by definition, you get this symmetry in the continuum 
And then once you have this, the translation symmetry for every X in uh, any delta Z2, you, you are done. Okay. So scale invariance, translation invariance, two very nice properties of omega continuous. Why is it nice? Because the more symmetries you have on the limiting objects, the better you understand it, right? This is just a phenomenon in nature. Symmetric objects are just encoded by fewer degrees of freedom. So they are much better understood. So the more you will be able to prove symmetries of the model, the more information you will get on it. So we already have two. Let's try to see whether we can do better than that. And that's where the true genius of physicists uh, kicks in, is that physicists are actually predicting another symmetry, which is, at least from my point of view, much less obvious. And this symmetry is rotation symmetry. So third point, rotation symmetry. So obviously, sorry, I don't know how to write. Obviously, at the discrete level, the model is symmetric by rotations of angle pi over two. And uh, I mean, more generally, any multiple uh, integer multiple of pi over two. Okay, so at discrete level, omega delta is symmetric under rho theta, where theta is in pi over two z, uh, no, pi over two z. Okay, simply because that's a symmetry of the underlying lattice. So it's clear that if you define Bernoulli pair collision on the lattice or on the rotation by pi over two of the lattice, you obtain the same random variable. It's completely clear at the discrete. So it's also getting to the continuum for free. But the conjecture is actually much stronger than that. So the conjecture is that it's true under any rotation. So for every theta in R, omega continuous has the same law as rho theta omega continuous. And this is a very strong symmetry and maybe a surprising one. I mean, translation symmetry, I mean, scale invariance for sure, if you have convergence, it's not that surprising. Translation invariance is almost obvious because I mean, it's almost already true at the discrete, but this rotation invariance, at least to me, the first time I was facing this statement that uh, somebody told me this should be uh, rotation invariance, I was very surprised. I, I couldn't see why, I mean, rotation by pi over three, should be a symmetry of the limiting object. And indeed, maybe the justification by physicists is a little bit more, I mean, it's substantially more evolved than uh, just the argument that I mentioned here for scale invariance and translation invariance. So let me very, very, very briefly tell you how uh, one can predict rotation invariance and it's going to be a kind of weak justification but it's the best one I can come up with somehow in a, in a little uh, in, in a short time. So physicists will argue that you can use what they call the renormalization group formalism. Renormalization group formalism which I will refer to as RG below, even though I'm not certain I will reuse it. So this is a big word. I mean, three big words. Uh, can, okay, there is a question. Let me first answer the question. Can one think of the limit as Gromov-Hausdorff limits? For the loops, yes, it's exactly what you will do. And then the conjectural existence statement is equivalent to saying that the limit is unique. Yes, so of course, I mean, for the family of loops, you need to prove some pre-compactness. 
And this is indeed done. You can prove that this omega delta, they form a tight family of, uh, I mean, if you want loop, uh, I mean, collection of, of random loops. By the way, I see Michael, I don't know if it's Michael Eisenman, but I mean, Michael Eisenman came up with a Burchard in, in 98 with a very, very uh, convenient and powerful criterion to prove tightness of families of interfaces like that. So indeed, tightness is uh, proved. So what is difficult, you exactly put uh, your finger on it, is to prove the uniqueness of possible subsequential limits. And I will come back to this because there is one case where we know how to do that. And you will see somehow it's a nice twist. And uh, I mean, it, it will maybe enlighten you. But indeed, uh, uniqueness of possible subsequent limit is a difficult, you're entirely right. So let me come back to the renormalization group formalism. So if I just, you know, do a lazy uh, explanation of that, I would say, the RG is basically saying that rescaling of the lattice or of the model by uh, a factor lambda is like, I mean, it corresponds to applying a certain map. It's very, very uh, uh, vague, but I mean, for good reason that it's very difficult to make rigorous. Uh, uh, applying a map T lambda. I can actually tell you what is the map at the end for Bernoulli percolation because in this case you can make sense of it. Um, a map in the space of models. So, in some sense, you can imagine that rescaling is like I take my model and I apply a kind of abstract map on models that take a model and spit a, a rescaled model, okay? And then if you think about it, then because omega continuous is the limit of the omega delta when delta tends to zero, it's also the limit of the omega delta over lambda to the n for delta tends to zero. Oh, uh, sorry, by a factor n. So let's say lambda to the n delta. So you can also kind of think of it, and this is a limit when n tends to infinity. Think of lambda smaller than one, okay? Then it's the limit when n tends to infinity of t lambda to the n of omega delta. You can think of it as just applying this kind of abstract map to the model and time and just go let n go to infinity. But if this is true, if you can make sense of this kind of dynamical uh, vision of convergence of, of, of the limit, then omega continuous should be equal to T lambda of omega continuous. It should be a fixed point for this operation. And of course, this should be true for every lambda. Okay, so then, what the uh, what the, the the physicists predict, and this is maybe the big uh, conjecture, like the the juice of the conjecture, is that they predict that there is a unique fixed point for these operations. Right, you are in a dynamical systems. You have fixed point for the map where there is a unique one. I mean, there are actually some trivial ones, but let's roughly say there is a unique one. But if there is a unique fixed point, when I start from Z2, so if I start from delta equal one and I apply iterate the T lambda, I end up with a fixed point because I'm in a dynamical system, you know, imagine that everything is behaving nicely. I iterate, I must end up in the fixed point. But if I do the same thing with a rotation of Z2, I define just the model on the rotation and I iterate, well, to what can I converge? I mean, I must converge to the unique fixed point again. So I converge to the same thing. So the uniqueness of the fixed point is really 
what is going to give me the rotation invariance. Of course, I mean, I just translated the conjecture of rotation invariance into another conjecture, which is uniqueness of the fixed point of this renormalization group, which, by the way, is absolutely non-trivial to define. But for Bernoulli percolation, you can guess what is the map. So you, I mean, at least there, you can make maybe sense of this whole dynamical system, but it's not obvious in general. But then if you assume uniqueness of the fixed point, then you get rotation invariance. Did I at least convince you that it's less obvious than translation and scaling? And I hope that this is at least uh, one, one thing I can convince you of. Okay, but if you assume uniqueness and physicists were happy with, uh, and they are right, I mean, uh, there should be uniqueness, I think, uh, then you get rotation invariance. Okay, so that's a good, uh, good property. Um, okay. Let's go further. I mean, why stopping at scale, rotation, and translation? Well, physicists didn't stop there. What they did is that they went to an additional uh, translate. I mean, sorry, uh, symmetry. So a symmetry to rule them all. So there is a, a, an even stronger conjecture, an absolutely uh, uh, groundbreaking conjecture, which changed completely the face of the, our understanding of, of, uh, of uh, two-dimensional systems and even higher dimensional. So it's a conjecture which you can already see in Kadanov work, but the first groundbreaking, like, I mean, the, I mean, okay, well, it's Kadanov, but uh, very often people, yes? Sure. So there is a question ah, are there probabilities on loop space invariant under all three symmetries? Yes. Yes. There are many actually. Not a unique one, by the way, which makes it interesting. So here you need to be careful what you uh, I mean, what is the space of models you uh, you are working on, because there is not a single one of uh, there is not a single fixed point. There are several fixed points, and these fixed points, they are indeed invariant under the old three symmetries, and even the fourth symmetry I'm going to uh, talk to you about in a, in a second. Yes, so they are. OK, so Belavin, uh, Polyakov, and Zamolochikov. Let's say that. Kadanov was the first one to predict the symmetry and Belavin, Polyakov, and Zamolchikov transferred it into what we call a conformal field symmetry nowadays. And the symmetry is the following. In fact, for every conformal map, so one-to-one -one holomorphic map, let's call it F from omega to omega prime, where omega and omega prime are simply connected, say, and arbitrary. So I take a conformal map. Then I claim that uh, by, uh, yeah, I claim that omega continuous has the same, when I restrict it to omega prime, sorry, has the same law as f of omega continuous when restricted to omega. For people who don't like the restriction, what you just can think of is that the models are indexed by simply connected domains. And uh, yeah, just maybe muting that, perfect. Um, so models are indexed by a simply connected domain. And if I look at a simply connected domain, let's say my favorite one, the disk, there, I can basically define the omega continuous as taking the scaling limit when delta tends to zero of uh, the model on, on this uh, lattice. So I'm going to end up with a family of loops in the continuum. But what I can also do is I can take another domain, omega, which is mapped by a conformal map f. And what I can do is I can take the lattice here, take the scaling limit to end up with 
a loop model and just take the image by f of this random variable, which is a collection of loops. So I end up with another model, sorry. And what I claim is that here, the red and the green have the same law, okay? So it's a very, very strong symmetry. I mean, if you take F to be a rotation, a translation or a dilation, you exactly recover the symmetries that I mentioned before. But here, what I'm saying is that this is true for every conformal map. So when I was telling you earlier that it's interesting to have a lot of symmetries in a system because it's gonna and I mean, allow us to encode the limits with fewer parameters and to understand it much better. This is a textbook example of that. The conformal maps is an extremely rich group in dimension two of, of, of uh, symmetries. And it really allows you to say marvelous things about the continuum object. In particular, so once conformal map, uh, conformal invariance is proved, one can invoke, if you want to see me, I mean, you can invoke fields of mathematics and physics, like whole fields of mathematics and physics that don't have a priori anything to do with Bernoulli percolation, but whose study is providing a lot of information on Bernoulli percolation. So for instance, you can invoke what is known as conformal field symmetry, uh, uh, conformal uh, field series, sorry. So this is, I mean, CFT. It's something, it's, it was a, a flourishing um, uh, field of theoretical physics for many years. It's actually still uh, very active, which was exactly studying the field theory in physics that have these conformal symmetries and you can describe them very well. You can uh, parameterize them by parameter like the central charge. You can get what are called uh, critical exponents, blah, blah. You can get a lot of things. And these conformal field theories start applying to a model as soon as you have proved conformal invariance. You can also use all the theory of the Schramm-Lovner evolution and everything that followed, Schramm-Lovner evolution. So SLE, which is exactly describing interfaces that are conformally invariant. And this also, if you are a probabilist, you definitely uh, heard about this more than once. Um, and uh, this also provides a lot of information on the critical. Uh, Trish, is the limiting object really a field theory in the sense of being a measure of a distribution satisfying OS plus its CFT axioms? Okay, that's a delicate question. You are entirely right. Um, so the Ostevader Schrader uh, axioms, uh, I think that probably you can prove them from the thing. What, I mean, depends what you want to be using in the conformal feed uh, theory. So the way physicists derive things sometimes is indeed not fully justified, even if you prove conformal field theory, uh, conformal invariance. For instance, they use conformal bootstrap, and the conformal bootstrap is relying on OPE, which is an operator, uh, an operator expansion, which we don't know how to justify, even when we have uh, conformal invariance. But if I start to say that you cannot use CFT once you have proved conformal invariance, they are going to be, you know, physicists from uh, Paris Saclay and uh, that are going to start to knock at my door and saying that, uh, you know, <laughs> they should finish with it. We, we have an history of, of uh, doing bad things to people, right? So in France, I don't want to be finishing at the, the top of a peak. So, <laughs> so CFT is usable, at least uh, a large bunch of, of CFT theory can still be used, but indeed, as a probabilist and as a mathematician, I would say that uh, the best way to derive the results you want to be using once you have proved conformal invariance is to use more the Schramm-Lovner evolution type 
uh, arguments. But uh, okay, don't uh, don't repeat that to the authors. Um, just to give you an example for people who may think that everything I'm, I'm saying now is a little bit abstract, uh, here is one thing you can prove once you have done that. So imagine I see that there is a new question. Let me just finish this and I answer the question. So take theta p to be the probability that zero is connected to infinity in the lattice, really, on z2. Okay. So I told you p smaller than pc, it's zero. There is no infinite connected components. At pc, it's zero because there is no infinite connected component again. And at p larger than pc, it is strictly positive. So if you start drawing it, it looks like that. Okay, and it gets, it gets to one at one. Well, in fact, you can prove, once you have proved conformal invariance, you can prove this thing. So you can exactly get the way it goes to zero when P goes to PC. This is called a critical exponent, this quantity. Uh, sorry, my goal was not to do that, but this, this is a critical exponent and it's a very important quantity in physics to understand the phase transition. So this is one of the things you can get from uh, conformal invariance. And if you don't have conformal invariance, guessing that you should end up with five over 36 is maybe not so easy. You will at least uh, grant me that. So, so this there is a comes via SLE, this number? Sorry, yes, it comes from SLE. Yes, from the study of SLE, indeed. Uh, so there is a question, do percolation on nerves of sickle packing on a simply connected domain as a packing becomes finer have a limit? In that case, this conformal invariance seems more believable by sourcing description of the man map. Um, Okay, so this is a good question. So it's not gonna, the discrete, or, I mean, it's, it's related to how you would prove uh, conformal invariance in general. And you can believe indeed that if you start from a structure that is already some kind of discretization of uh, holomorphic theory, I mean, a theory of holomorphic maps, maybe it's going to simplify. So indeed, if you start with circle packings that are one way of discretized holomorphic maps and holomorphic metrics, um, then maybe it could be simpler. It actually, you lose many things by doing it and you don't gain as much as you want. So it's not known that you have this convergence. I'm going to tell you actually the only case in Bernoulli percolation where we know convergence and it's not this one. And I, I don't think that there is really, it's easy to go with this uh, uh, circular packings. Okay, um, let me just try to tell you, but uh, maybe there I'm gonna be a little bit fast because I'm starting to see that I'm, uh, I mean, I only have 10 minutes left, hoping that I had one hour at the beginning, which maybe was not the case. Uh, so let me try to go a little bit faster, but tell you a little bit why you could expect conformal uh, symmetry is that imagine, I, I, I like this picture. So take this picture here. So imagine you have a domain and you cut it into small patches. And in each patch, so imagine this size here is epsilon, which is much smaller than one, but much larger than delta, okay? Now, if you look at the conformal map, locally, it looks like the composition of a rotation, a scaling, and a translation. So if I look, so here, if I redo my drawing, so imagine I am mapping the square lattice to this map. So I'm gonna end up with a kind of strange uh, lattice, which is the image of the square lattice by F. But the important thing is that in each one of this patch, this image is gonna look very, very much like just a rotated, scaled, and translated version of the square lattice. Okay, so maybe here it's gonna look like this. Maybe here it's gonna look like uh, this. Here, like this. I mean, of course, I mean, I'm not doing a, a C1 function here, but I just want to be illustrating a little bit. So locally, the, this modified lattice, this bended lattice looks like 
rotation, scaling, and, uh, and the translated version of the square lattice. But then, at least per collation restricted to each patch, should look like the original percolation model on a square lattice because we know the symmetries, the rotation, the scale, and the translation symmetry. So each one of these patch should basically look like it will be on the square lattice. So then if you believe me, which is not obvious and actually not even proved, if you believe me that you can kind of glue back the patches, then you end up, even if you started with this kind of modified version of the square lattice, you end up with an actual true square lattice to start from. So that's why if locally you look like rotation, scaling, and uh, translation, then the limits should still be the same. That's the idea of how you get conformal symmetry from translation, scaling, and rotation. Physicists will summarize this in one crystalline sentence, which will spend, I mean, then mathematic, mathematicians spend uh, 100 years trying to justify, which is that the limit should be a local field theory. And therefore, any map which is locally a rotation, scaling, and a translation should also preserve the field. Okay. By the way, surprisingly enough, at least to me, it was very surprising, maybe not to my two co-authors, but with Johan Manulescu and Vincent uh, Tassion, we have almost a proof of this for Bernoulli percolation, almost in the sense that we have a stupid assumption on critical exponents, which is very, very believable, which has nothing to do with uh, heavy physics or a, a difficult taking the scaling limit, which is exactly saying, if you have rotation, scaling, and a translation, you get conformal invariance. But I mean, it's, I mean, we are trying, of course, to get rid of this, uh, this knowing assumption to really have a true full theorem, which would make sense of this idea of physics that if you are a local field, then uh, any map which is locally like you want should be preserving your, your field. Let me finish with a theorem, because I mean, okay, I, I told you a lot about, uh, about um, what is predicted, but let me tell you a little bit about what is done, and this will give an advertisement for next week to our class. Okay, so what is rigorously known? So what I'm gonna first give, give you is a message of hope in the sense that, well, it's difficult, but sometimes you manage, if you are clever enough, meaning if you are stas near enough, you manage to prove conformal invariance. So for a few models, and I'm going to insist on this because there are very few examples, for a few models of 2D statistical physics, conformal invariance is known. But it's a very delicate story. There are very few of these examples and they are, it's a very fragile approach. Like you can prove it for one model and then you modify a little bit your model, it doesn't work at all. And to give you an example, actually there is an example of a Bernoulli percolation model that is conformally invariant, but that's a site Bernoulli percolation model, meaning that you open vertices of your lattice, not edges. Okay, sites, and it's on the triangular lattice. So what you do, if you want, is you have your triangular lattice, and let me color open edges in blue and uh, close edges in yellow to uh, follow the tradition. I mean, Stas was in uh, Sweden when he proved this result. So you just color like that the vertices of your lattice. You look at the blue vertices are being your open vertices. You look at the connected components of blue 
vertices. And there you can prove that you can take the scaling limit when delta tends to zero and that you get something conformally invariant. Okay, so this is a result by Stas Mirnov from 2001. And maybe at the time people believe that then, you know, we are gonna manage to get conformal invariance of a large class of models because the proof is so crystal clear, so clean, so short that it kind of made people believe that uh, more were, would be coming. And in fact, very few came later on. It's very like isolated cases where you can prove conformal invariance. I would even say that these cases, you kind of know very well why those cases should work and not the others. So it's, it's a delicate story. So in, a, in, a, in recent years, like in the two or three last years, we decided with a, a group of co-authors to try to follow a little bit more the road of physicists and to try to go step by step, not go directly for the kill if you want, not go directly for conformal invariance, but try to go through the rotation invariance, scale invariance, and then maybe scale plus rotation implies and translation implies conformal invariance. And to the maybe to my surprise, um, I was expecting that I mean getting conformal invariance from the three other symmetries would be the easier step, and I still believe it is the case and it's probably doable. I would have said that the hardest uh, step was to prove rotation invariance, because for me, at least the justification of the physicist is the weakest one out of the three arguments. Existence of a limit, I mean, come on, I mean, it should be converging. I mean, I'm not, uh, I'm not somebody who believes in, uh, in a twisted uh, God that will play with, you know, trying to make things fluctuate too much. It should converge. Okay, so scale invariance should be obvious. It's difficult to prove, but at least it's very well understood why it should be scale invariant. The conformal invariance, I told you, even for Bernoulli percolation, we almost have a proof. So that's working very well. But this rotation invariance, this uniqueness of the renormalization group, for me, it was like uh, science fiction, basically. And surprisingly, we didn't do it at all through, rotation, uh, through the renormalization group. But the only thing we managed to prove is rotational invariance, which is, uh, to me, a very, very surprising thing. So CRM, it's by myself with Diba Krashen, uh, Karol Kozlovsky. Okay, so I'm Kozlovsky. I hope he's not in the audience. <laughs> Kozlovsky. I'm done with it. Uh, Manulescu, Anu Lamara. And what we prove is the following. We prove that for every epsilon, so I'm gonna state the simplest statement, but we have much more than that and you will see that next week. There exists a delta zero such that for any delta smaller than delta zero of epsilon. And for every theta in R, well, we have rotation, approximate rotation invariance, meaning the following. Imagine that you take the probability on delta Z2. So let me maybe write the delta in green. On delta Z2 of I'm just taking an example of something you can compute, but in fact, we really have the full rotation invariance, but I want to be stating something that is understandable. So what you could do is you can try to look at the crossing probability in a rectangle. So you, get, you look at crossing probability, the square lattice, and you compare, so meaning the existence of a path of open edges, and you compare it to the same quantity, but when you define the model on the rotated version of the square lattice, okay, sorry. And what you get is that the, pro the difference of probability is smaller than epsilon. So another way of putting is that whatever the epsilon, if you take 
delta sufficiently small, you have the rotation invariance. If you don't rescale, it means that whatever epsilon, if you just look at a big enough crossing probability, then, I mean, a big enough quad, a big enough topological rectangle, you have that the crossing probability is invariant on the rotation. Next week, I will give you actually a crystal clear statement of rotation invariance, which will really mean you take the realization of your model, you take the realization of an independent version, you rotate it, you have a way to couple it in such a way that they are very close to each other. So it's really the full rotation invariance. And just here to be stating something rigorous, so it's for every topological rectangle, Q, A, B, C, D, with extremal length, which is not too small or too big. This is just to be stating something rigorous, but think of just a rectangle. Think of a rectangle of given aspect ratio, okay? And just one last sentence to budget, and I'm giving back uh, the microphone. You can continue. <laughs> the, the interesting thing here is that this works for, the, for Bernoulli percolation, but it in fact works for a large class of models. It works for every Fortuin Castellan percolation. And maybe this is going back to a question that was mentioned before, which was were they limiting loop ensembles that have the properties in question? So the answer is yes. They are called CLEs, conformal loop ensembles. And these conformal loop ensembles, they are parameterized by a parameter, kappa. And if you look at all the possible limits of this fortuin castellan percolation, you would be able to describe a whole range of interesting CLEs. Why up to now, conformal invariance is restricted to a few examples of CLEs. So that's why we are very happy with this fortuin castellan universality class, I mean, a group of, of models is because they describe the whole range of what we call universality classes. So this, I went maybe a little bit fast on this, uh, this uh, theorem, but like that, at least maybe if you want a cleaner statement and more details, you will have to come next week. So, you know, you, you have to support me again. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Hugo. And let us all thank Hugo for a very beautiful talk. Uh, are there any questions? I think there are two questions in the chat questions. box. Yeah. Is there uh, something like epsilon conformal invariance? Or is, or it, is nonsense? it nonsense? What do you mean by epsilon conformal invariance? I think the question is. Yeah, Can one make sense of something like that? I don't no know. idea. Can it make sense? Yeah. I think your theorem was stated, was stated on a, actually a lattice of size delta. Yes, yes. So I, I guess, so because it's not yet the continuum limit, you had to... Okay, so I, I just stated it like that because I didn't want to even be discussing limits because actually we don't know there is a limit. But notice that any sub-sequential limit, if you apply this theorem, must be rotation invariant, truly rotation invariant, right? Because for any epsilon, you can pick delta small enough that the difference is smaller than epsilon. So in the continuum, in the limit, the two quantities must be equal. I just stated it in such a way that there is no taking the limit just to have a clean statement. But if you want, you can also state it. So let me restate it here. Any subsequential limit of uh, I'm omega starting delta. to get ready. We can Is leave. I, I'm going to Kapu Party's house. You want to come? Yeah, uh, I, I, I will not be able to come. I'm too, too far away. <laughs> um, so, but in the discrete, it's not entirely clear how you will make sense of uh, discretization of conformal invariance. It's really something in the continuum, 
but here I just stated the thing in a, in a way that it doesn't refer to uh, to uh, to the limit, but otherwise you can state it with the limit, and it gives you true rotation invariance. So it's not an approximate result; it's just uh, the best you can hope for in the discrete. So there was another question, Trish. Uh, wait, sorry, are you already able to show the limits are not in the same universality class? This is not very difficult because crossing probabilities in a certain topology, uh, I mean, if you take a, a square with wired, wired, free, free boundary condition, let me just say, uh, maybe people don't understand what this is, but that's fine. This thing converges to one over Q. So it's already not the same limit for different queues, and you can easily deduce from that that you don't have the same limit. So this is not uh, uh, this is not difficult. Proving that you don't have the same limit is uh, is not difficult. Okay. So can you get uh, can you think of any models which are in the same universality class as binary percolation? Oh, Voronoi percolation, Boolean okay, percolation so with sufficiently uh, short range. Uh, you can take uh, um, Bergman Fock percolation. You have a lot of models that uh, have very short range in some sense dependencies, and they all fall in the, in the universality class of, uh, of Bernoulli percolation. Okay, great, thanks. So they all converge, uh, sorry for, for the others. They all converge when you take the scaling limit to the same limit as uh, Bernoulli percolation. Uh, in higher dimension, are these symmetries similar to conformal symmetries to be expected? In fact, exactly the same. I mean, the argument that I discussed today is not specific to two dimension. It works in any dimension. So what's the catch? The catch is just that there are very few conformal maps in higher dimension. So you have fewer symmetries. If you have fewer symmetries, it's harder to describe the limiting objects. So conformal field theory is a much weaker tool in a higher dimension. Doesn't mean it's a useless one. There are extremely impressive uh, progress in recent years based on the conformal bootstrap. And actually one of my colleagues at IHES is uh, is at the forefront of, of this development, so Slava Rishkov, where they manage to use still conformal invariance and conformal field theory to try to not compute the critical exponents in dimension three, but they still manage to kind of bound, I mean, to, to, to reduce the range of possible parameters for these critical exponents. And it's, they manage to get things that are much more precise I mean, of course, it's, uh, you have to be careful, but uh, with more digits than, uh, say, uh, Monte Carlo simulations. So, so you can still use conformal field symmetry in higher dimension. It just gives you less, so it's more difficult. Uh, Mahan, for a bounded domain, when you pass to the scaling limit, assuming it exists, what is the kind of information that is there on the boundary topological circle? There's some kind of bulk boundary correspondence. Uh, okay, I'm not entirely sure I understand the question, but uh, there were de different developments in conformal field theory, and it really started with full plane conformal field theories. But then Cardi in uh, the 90s started describing boundary conformal field symmetries, uh, conformal field in, uh, series, sorry. So conformal field theories that are in finite domains and where the boundary is playing a role. And then what happens on the boundary is slightly different of what happens in the bulk. And you have indeed relations between the behavior in the bulk and the behavior on the boundary. And it's a very interesting, uh, I mean, it's, it's fundamental even to the understanding of, of the statistical physics models. So, so just uh, carrying on from, I think, Zhao's question. So in 3D, um, yeah. the cro crossing probabilities is a much harder question, right? So then can you prove that these things are in a different uh, universality class or is it even, is it even um, true? Yeah, it is true. There should be in different universality classes, but uh, you know, we don't even know how to prove that they have 
a continuous phase transition. Whether right, they yeah, my, so yeah my, so. my question was more, are they in a different universality class? Because it wasn't- Yes, just, they are. They definitely okay. are. Yes. yes. I mean, they definitely should be, <laughs> I should say. Okay, well, thank you very much. So next week, I will give you more details on the statement and on the proof. Okay, let's all thank you again for this wonderful talk. Thank you. So, thank you very much. Hope, hope to see you all next week. Bye-bye. <laughs>